Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started momentarily. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual press conference for Audubon Great Lakes vision for restoring the Great Lakes for birds and people. We're gonna get started shortly. I just wanted to do a couple housekeeping items. Um, for today's press conference, we're gonna have two speakers and we will also have Q&A at the end of the session. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will um, hope to answer those um, following the press conference. And you can also follow up with us. We'll put contact information in for the communication folks if you have specific questions and we will be sending out a press release afterwards as well. I also wanted to let you know today's session will be recorded. And we're just gonna wait a few more minutes. I think we have a couple more people joining us. Please keep yourselves muted throughout too, and we'll be able to, again, answer questions following the press conference. And if you do wanna have any time uh, speaking specifically with any of our experts, we can set those individual interviews up as well. Again, my name is Nicole Minadio. I am the communications director for Audubon Great Lakes. And I think we're about ready to get started. All right, with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle Parker, Audubon Great Lakes Executive Director, to kick us off today for the press conference. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Michelle Parker. I'm the Executive Director of Audubon Great Lakes, which is a regional office of the National Audubon Society. And it's World Water Day. What a better way to celebrate World Water Day than to gather together for the sake of the Great Lakes. We're so happy to have you here. It's also spring migration when millions of birds return to the Great Lakes. They may stay for the season. They may just stop for some rest and some fuel before they head north for the summer. This is the time of year when I welcome back one of my favorite species, the sandhill crane. You can often hear the cranes before you see the cranes. Um, Nicole, if you wouldn't mind flipping the slide so everybody can see a picture of the cranes too. We'll skip Nat's picture. Let's go to the cranes. There we are. So sandhill cranes, like I said, you usually hear them. Before you see them, they make a racket up in the sky. When you hear them and you look up, you might think that you're looking at a flock of geese flying overhead, but the telltale sign is if you see those long legs tailing behind the birds, then it's a crane. And to see cranes in person, it's like looking at dinosaurs. They're tall birds, they can be five feet tall. My favorite part about sandhill cranes are that red bright heart right on their foreheads. I like to think that's Mother Nature's way of saying, love me. So I hope today you celebrate World Water Day and I hope you keep your eyes and ears to the sky to welcome home our migrants. So today we're here to share our plan for the Great Lakes with you, our blueprint for restoring and protecting the Great Lakes. Before I jump into that, I'd like to share Audubon's wingspan in the region. As you likely know, eight states and two Canadian provinces share the Great Lakes 10,000 miles of coastline. Audubon is active across those eight states. We have 121 chapters or volunteers and advocates. We have almost 400,000 members. These are people who have quite literally opted in to our mission to protect and ensure the health of natural spaces for birds and for people. We're a science-based organization and we listen to birds. The birds are telling us that it's time to act on behalf of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes is a vast, robust system, the largest freshwater ecosystem in the world, and it's struggling. And we know this because the birds are telling us so. Audubon often says that where birds thrive, people thrive. 
And yet what we're seeing in the Great Lakes are significant declines in our native bird populations, some upwards of 80%. We have a good idea why. There's invasive species, pollution, coastal degradation, development, anything you can imagine, it's probably here in the Great Lakes region, stressing the system. 350 species of birds call the Great Lakes home. Countless species of other wildlife do as well. I like to say from moose to spruce, you see it all here in the Great Lakes. 40 million people rely on the Great Lakes for clean drinking water. This system is vast and it's precious and it's ours and it's our responsibility. Like I said, we're a science-based organization. We know what we need to do and we know where to do it. And because of that, we have hope. And today we're talking about hope for the Great Lakes and all of our responsibilities toward it. So we've gathered here today for the public launch of our Great Lakes plan, our Great Lakes blueprint for restoring and protecting coastal areas within the Great Lakes. We've identified 12 regions that are critical to bring back, to restore the health of our system. Within those 12 regions, we've identified 42 projects that touch nearly 300,000 acres of coastal wetlands. We've already gotten started on some of this work. And where we are working, we're already seeing success. The birds are telling us we're in the right places doing the right work. Nat will discuss that a little bit later. We have a vast network of people. We have partners, we have members, we have advocates, we have chapters, we have all of you. And this work is critical and it's timely, we have to do it now. It is quite literally all hands on deck. You could say all wings on deck. We have hope. We need all of you. We need your voices. We need you to amplify the need and amplify the stories, amplify what people can do because we're all in this together. To go into the details of our plan, I'm gonna pass it off to Nat Miller, who's our Director of Conservation, both for the Great Lakes and for the Upper Mississippi River. Nat is a persistent source of energy, inspiration, ambition, and hope for all of us working within the Great Lakes region. I think you're gonna find the same from him. He's also one of the chief architects of this plan. So no better person to walk you through it than Nat. Thank you again for joining us today. Over to Nat. Thanks, Michelle. So as Michelle says, this really is a bird emergency. We don't think that's hyperbole to say. Uh, as often is the case, birds are currently serving as an indicator for larger environmental problems. And today they're telling us that it's a critical time to act now to save the wildlife, water, and way of life in the Great Lakes region. In less than a lifetime, in 50 short years, North America has lost more than one in four of its birds quarter of the population. It's 3 billion individual birds have been lost. This report was just released last year in the world's leading scientific journal, Science. It finds that 2.9 breeding adult birds have been lost since 1970. This includes rare species, but also common species. Songbirds like Eastern Meadowlark and Western Meadowlark, even birds that you see in your backyard at your feeders, like white-throated sparrow and dark-eyed junco have lost more than a million, than 100 million of those individual birds within that species in the last 50 years, in, in the time that many people have been working on conservation. This disappearance of even common species is an indication that our ecosystems are shifting in a, in a bad way. Some good news out of this report is that some water birds, waterfowl in particular, ducks, have seen population gains over the last 50 years due in large part to political action, the Clean Water Act of the early 1970s, protecting no net loss of wetlands. We know conservation can work for these species. Some of the, the most impacted species, if you go to the next slide, Nicole, grassland birds. We've lost over half of the population since the 1970s. 
some of these species like eastern meadowlark, three quarters of the population, three and four eastern meadowlarks, a bird used to be common seen in fields are now decimated in population. Migratory birds, many of our songbirds, forest birds migrate long distances twice a year to South, Southern North America or the Caribbean, Central America, South America. 40% um, of those species have um, declined. Uh, those species have declined by 40%. Some of them, like the beautiful Baltimore Oriole, um, over half of their species have, have declined. Aerial insectivores, birds that pick insects out of the air. Uh, we know there's in, insect populations are, are declining and so are, those species, are the bird species that depend on those insect populations. 32% of aerial insectivores, birds, common birds like barn swallows. Again, uh, two and five of those individual birds are gone since the 1970s. Furthermore, Audubon's new climate science points to two thirds of birds in North America. We looked at 604 species that call North America home and 389 of those species are threatened with extinction due to climate change. Projected to lose up to 100% of, of their climatic suitability current habitat if trends continue in global warming. The good news is if we take action now, there's still time. There's still time to take action on climate change. So if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the projected climatic uh, shifts for our species, a grassland species bobolink and a water bird common loon. Those species are projected to lose nearly 100% of their range if global warming trends continue. But if we can reduce warming to about 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is really the best case scenario now, then we can maintain a significant portion of those birds current range and they won't have to adapt so heavily. In the Great Lakes, we have unique, we have, we have all those threats that Michelle mentioned that are in many places, um, agricultural development, uh, coastal development, pollution. We also have unique issues here because of our coasts, our 10,000 miles of coasts, rapid fluctuations of lake levels, uncertain changes of lake levels, coastal flooding from climate change, sewage, combined sewage overflows in many of our urban areas are really exacerbating the impacts on birds. Um, and the spread of invasive species is prevalent here um, and really degrading much of the habitat that birds depend on, especially in coastal areas. At the same time, those impacts, those, those threats impact people. I think the, the, the Great Lakes are a drinking source for 40 million people in the region um, and really depend on clean air, clean water and coastal in a resilient coastline. Some of the birds that we're seeing uh, drop in population the most in the Great Lakes region are birds that depend on high quality wetlands. So now again, with the Clean Water Act of 1972, we have no net loss of wetlands, although that could be debated, um, but we are seeing a rapid degradation in our wetlands because of pollution, invasive species and altered and fragmented hydrology. Um, some of these birds are, are we call them secretive marsh birds. So they're not well known. Um, and now that we've been studying them more closely for the last several years, we're recognizing uh, their, their strong need and, um, and the ability to recover their populations. These are birds like pied-billed grebe, which is uh, somewhat of a, I like to think of a mix between a, a duck and a marsh bird because it looks like a duck and it's got the name, nickname the hell diver. And that's because it can dive very deep like a diving duck to get uh, the fish it depends on in these deeper coastal marsh systems. It's got a, a really unique uh, whooping call that we'll play for you here. If you ever hear that before sunrise in a marsh, it can terrify you. You think it's an animal the size of a, of a moose, but it's really a tiny bird, a very loud whoop. Um, bird like the American coot, check out those feet on that coot is standing, up, standing through water on emergent vegetation like wearing snowshoes so that it can walk around on really flimsy uh, vegetation. Also behaving much like a duck in, in, in the way that it uh, navigates a deeper, deeper marsh. In the shallower marshes, we find birds like the Virginia rail on the bottom left, um, who if you hear this call, it sounds like a group of pigs, I feel like. And we'll play that call for you now too of the Virginia rail. 
Pretty great, right? Virginia Rail uh, is, I, I call it a, a marsh chicken because it, uh, it acts and moves around quite like. In kind of the mix, not too deep of water, not too shallow, um, really dependent on emergent vegetation like rushes and cattails and are born, they have spur. Having to swim too much. All four of these species um, have declined steadily and precipitously since the 1990s. Um, these dec declines highlight the plight of marsh bird species in general. Uh, we're looking at about 14, we're looking at 14 folk, what we call focal or flagship marsh bird species that depend on high quality water bodies uh, near the Great Lakes region. Black terns are a great, um, are a great uh, flagship for our work as well. This is a really incredible, beautiful bird that behaves like a seabird most of its life. In the winter right now, it's uh, on open ocean water in, off the coast of South America, Colombia or Venezuela, depending on fish and open ocean fish and really not coming to land at all. It returns in a couple months, it'll start its, um, its migration back to the Great Lakes where it'll become a marsh bird and it'll build nests like this in our Great Lakes coastal wetland system and produce, hopefully produce young that can, uh, that can sustain the population. Unfortunately, this bird has suffered larger population declines than any marsh bird in the Great Lakes, up to 80% of a population decline um, in this region. Um, in places like uh, St. Clair Flats in Michigan, we have the largest colony of black terns. We're really focusing on uh, protecting those birds and ensuring that they have the most breeding success as possible to sustain that population. And that's the good news. The good news here is that we have a plan. We know restoration of habitat and conservation works. Uh, and we have a, a blueprint, as Michelle mentioned, to, to invest in the most, in the most strategic areas uh, to bring those birds back. And at the same time, improve our coastal wetland and coastal watershed system for the benefit of people in the Great Lakes. Great Lakes coastal wetlands provide critical resources uh, for people. We've lost historically over half of those wetlands. Um, in some places like Ohio has lost over 70% of their coastal wetlands. Um, now that those wetlands are protected um, by the Clean Water Act, uh, we have less uh, just total wiping out of wetlands, but many of those wetlands are now severely degraded with invasive species or altered hydrology that turns them into more like muddy ponds. Uh, than rich mosaics of wetlands. So restoring those coastal wetlands is the pinch point in the population for these birds. If we restore those coastal wetlands, we build a resilient system for our people that live in the coastal areas and we can recover these populations. With over the last decade, we've seen rapid rise in water levels in the Great Lakes. The, the, the future of Great Lakes water levels is uncertain. And that's one of the most challenging things in terms of planning for conservation. We know, we know Great Lakes water levels can rise very quickly and lower very quickly. I often talk to my colleagues who live. That's a problem, but have you dealt with six, six feet change in water levels over the course of three years? Because we have in the Great Lakes areas. Again, as a as an indicator, as the canary in the coal mine. We know that as marsh bird populations plummet in these coastal areas, we no longer have that benefit of the coastal wetlands. So given this urgent need to protect and restore remaining, the remaining coastal wetlands for wildlife and people, we developed a spatial prioritization to identify the most important US coastal wetlands for 14 species of marsh birds representing high quality wetland habitat. This highlights areas where investing in wetland conservation and restoration will make the biggest impact for birds and water quality. Our science identifies the highest priority coastal regions for marsh birds, water quality, and coastal resiliency. With the data and maps at hand, Audubon is now activating our membership, forming partnerships, and taking on the ground action to protect, restore, and steward the most critical habitat in 12 priority regions across the Great Lakes. We've coupled this spatial prioritization model 
with the on the ground knowledge of Audubon scientists and volunteers in the Great Lakes region to develop a suite of restoration, conservation, research, and stewardship projects that will collectively address the recovery and health of The model's results guided our selection of the regions of the Great Lakes coastal wetlands in which we undertake conservation action. Then we can examine these regions to identify key landowners and stakeholders of the specific high priority wetlands. This level of specificity allows us to be more proactive and effective in our partnership development, outreach, and project planning. In priority regions such as St. Louis River Estuary, Green Bay, the Calumet region, the St. Mary's River and Straits of Mackinac, Detroit and Lake St. Clair, Saginaw Bay, Western Lake Erie Basin, Buffalo, Rochester, Sotos Bay, and Eastern Lake Ontario. We are proposing 42 projects, several of them underway already, across the eight Great Lakes states, totaling nearly 300,000 acres of habitat that can be restored or protected for birds. We identified, we identified roughly 550,000 acres of high priority coastal wetlands. So a little more than half, if we invest in those, then we believe we can recover these populations. Here's some more of those species. I know we get bored with all the planning, so it's always good to see the birds again. Um, again, these birds depend on unique conditions. They're all a little different, um, but all of them depend on some level of high quality marsh. American bittern at the top, um, black crowned night heron is, is not on here, but we'll see pictures of later. Black tern, blue winged teal, common gallinule, least bittern, marsh wren, osprey, hydebill grebe, sandhill crane, sedge wren, sora, swamp sparrow, and Virginia rail. Utilizing bird data from the coastal wetland monitoring program, as well as habitat conditions, we were able to model the best areas for these birds. Here's the results of that model. That informed really where we're gonna work on the ground. The, the brighter yellow here, the more important currently for marsh birds. So really recognize the, the, the southern coast of the upper peninsula is really critical. And then several hot spots, of course, across the region that have informed our planning. We also have these data visualization tools that um, allow us to communicate how marsh birds are doing in these areas and inform the restoration and, and leverage funding to get the restoration done and track progress towards recovering species. This is an example from the Calumet region where we've just launched a data visualization tool, um, really showing the details of where these species are and how they're doing during the breeding season, which is a sign of how, how healthy the wetland is. Our partners in Calumet region, like the Forest Reserves of Cook County, are using this to get funding and restore hydrology, reconnect lakes, get rid of invasive plants, plant native plants, and, recover, and then recover populations. What I love to see on this is if you look at the graphs there, and it's hard to see in this detail, but from light turquoise to, to the pink is the five years. And we're starting to see positive trends. As you can see, those pink years are looking good for several of our focal species. Restoration gets results. But to restore highly altered and fragmented wetlands like in Calumet, which is not unique, long industrial past of, of the steel industry and railroads and roads and a lot of pollution, um, we have to do a lot of heavy lifting. In, in order to restore those 300,000 acres, it's gonna take significant investment, like from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to plan, design, engineer, and implement um, wetland restoration. Here's our uh, 12 priority regions again, in case I rattle them off too quickly. And then just to show you a quick, quick couple of highlights um, of, of projects in individual states. Um, that's a black turn on one of our volunteers heads, by the way, as we're monitoring uh, their breeding success at, um, at St. Clair Flats in Lake St. Clair. Michigan, we've identified three um, priority areas, the St. Mary's River and Straits of Mackinac region, Saginaw Bay and Eastern, um, Eastern Lake Michigan or Western Michigan, the river mouths of, of Western Michigan. Um, some of the work there focuses on restoring 
wetlands in Saginaw Bay that can uptake nutrients. As we know, there's a lot of agriculture areas dragging in, uh, draining into Saginaw Bay uh, that can uptake nutrients and provide critical habitat for black terns, where black terns are still breeding in significant numbers in Saginaw Bay, one of the few areas they're, they're remaining. Um, and the river mouths that's often focus on uh, creating um, softened shorelines, as we've seen a, a trend towards building more concrete and steel on our coastal areas uh, for immediate protection of, of the shoreline. In the long term, that's more expensive and it's, it doesn't create uh, sustainable habitat for birds. So softening of shorelines, uh, creating that wetland lesser grade that uh, can, can uh, sustain changes in lake levels. Uh, right. If, if lake levels fluctuate, if we have a shallow grade of, of coastal areas, then um, we can really adapt to that. Um, and St. Clair Flats is really our work is focused there on black terns because that is the critical breeding colony for this species in the Great Lakes region. Uh, and their numbers plummet, but in, in, uh, in St. Clair Flats, we're ensuring that they have adequate breeding habitat and monitoring nests, individual nests, to ensure uh, as low of predation as possible in these species and that the chicks hatch and fledge and can fly off to South America in the spring. Uh, the Calumet region I talked about a little bit um, already. Since 2005, we've already restored over 3,000 acres in Calumet. Uh, we're currently working on projects with the Chicago Park District, the Forest Preserves of Cook County, the Little Calumet River Basin Commission, and several other landowners to improve the remaining wetlands here. There's a tremendous potential for win-winning in Calumet, where we, where local communities have suffered environmental injustice for decades. Um, and uh, it's, it's important to note that re wetland restoration cannot uh, fix all our water quality issues. Uh, but they certainly can make a huge impact on nutrients and sediment and flooding. One of our greatest successes in Calumet has been talking to community members who have said, so you mean if I get, we can get less water in our basement and more marsh birds? And we say, yes, that's win-win. Fix flooding issues and create wetland habitat for, for breeding marsh birds. A lot of potential still to do a tremendous amount of wetland restoration in Calumet. Ohio. Um, Probably the most important area for migratory birds in the entire Great Lakes region is Western Lake Erie Basin as birds cross over Lake Erie in both spring and fall. Um, pretty soon they'll have festivals celebrating this in um, places like McGee Marsh. Um, we've identified 62,000 acres of wetlands in Western Lake Erie Basin just in the Ohio portion. Uh, and Audubon and partners will restore, will work to restore 18,000 of those for the benefit of birds and water quality in Lake Erie, which we all know has suffered uh, almost annual um, issues with harmful algae blooms. Again, tremendous potential for win-win for birds and, and water quality. Wisconsin, um, tremendous potential on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, Green Bay, has a vast majority of, of important coastal wetlands in Lake Michigan are in Green Bay and kind of the extended uh, area to the north. Um, those are areas where we've identified 200,000 acres of, of wetlands in both Green Bay and the St. Louis River estuary, uh, which is on the tip of Lake Superior near Duluth in Superior, Wisconsin. We're already working there with partners to restore many of these wetlands and bring birds back like black tern who have disappeared from places like the St. Louis River estuary. Um, been gone for almost 15 years now, and we're hoping to bring those, those guys back. Notice we had folks from New York on the call too, so just wanted to mention that we have a tremendous amount of uh, work happening in, in New York and the Niagara River and in Rochester in particular at Cranberry Pond, where construction is underway right now uh, to restore those coastal wetlands. So this isn't all doom and gloom. What's awesome about marsh birds is they are to use a Midwest quote, if you build it, they will come. Um, they are a great suite of species that respond to restoration. This is how we know that the bottleneck is habitat. As soon as we restore quality wetlands, we almost we get an immediate year after return of those, those species. Um, so in Chicago, where we've done a lot of this work, this is the sign of success. The next slide, Nicole, is, um, is the chicks. I don't know if you, would you call those birds cute or maybe weird at least, dinosaur-like? 
um, that's Elise Bittern on the right. Um, and I think, uh, is that Kamangalni on the left? Yeah. Um, if we see the chicks, then we know that they've had breeding success. And that's huge, huge, because obviously for biodiversity conservation, the math is pretty simple. You got to reproduce at least one offspring that successfully makes it to adulthood to breed itself in order to have a sustainable population. So from places like Big Marsh and Calumet, where restoration has been underway from 2015, um, in 2014 and 2015, uh, we had uh, basically no marsh birds there. I think one of our um, focal species. Now in 2018 and 2019, we're up to 11 of our focal species, thanks to work by the Chicago Park District to install water control management and remove invasive species. It's not rocket science, but it is a lot of work to get it done. Another great hopeful moment is the piping plover. There is, this bird we can all agree is very cute. Um, the offspring look like, um, the chicks look like cotton balls with toothpicks for legs. Um, this is a species that uh, bred in the Great Lakes numbers in, hu in huge numbers. So you can see from the map on the left, um, over 800 breeding pairs historically, went to a low of 17 pairs in 1986. Uh, and now we're back to about 75, approaching 80 pairs. And these birds depend on coastal areas, uh, beaches, and, um, and are with dedicated efforts to restore and protect beaches, we've seen the recovery. And there's still a lot of room to do. I was speaking to somebody from Ohio. You can see the map there on Lake Erie. We need more dots on Lake Erie. There's a lot of potential to get clover habitat back for these birds, but they're on their way. And that's a great sign, right? The, the dedicated efforts to, for restoration are working. So how can you help? Um, you can be an advocate for birds. You can speak up, you can talk to folks, you can write articles, do press, do press on, on, how these, um, on how these birds need our help and really how our, our environment needs our help, help altogether in the Great Lakes region. Um, Audubon's uniquely positioned with our vast membership to develop um, a, an army of advocates and stewards who can go out and actually take part in restoring these areas. And here you have a group of folks seeding a, a natural area, um, but the support for natural areas also comes by calling politicians and writing letters to the editor and visiting parks. So what a great way to support your parks is by visiting your parks and, and tweeting about it, right? And, and, and taking the time to observe birds, which is, is such a wonderful way to connect with nature. Um, and we have a ton of ways you can participate directly with Audubon, especially in our, in our science where uh, we ask for volunteers to help us document how marsh birds and other birds are doing every year. Um, so we'd, act, we'd act, ask you to get involved, support the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and other funding mechanisms at the state and federal level that support natural areas in the recovery of our habitat and our water and the pers perseverance of our way of life in, in the Great Lakes region. So I spoke a lot. I know we'll have some, we have time for questions. I think a couple have popped up in the chat already. I'd just like to leave you with um, the fact that, uh, uh, that we are in the time of, of a critical decision here of whether we're gonna invest in, these, in this work, invest in our wildlife to recover it um, and really save our Great Lakes system. Um, and we've got a blueprint to how to do that. It's gonna take a lot more than Audubon. It's gonna take a lot of partners and folks to get involved. Um, but we've we we are helped to, we're here to help lead the way. Um, so with that, I'll turn it I think back to Michelle or to Nicole and and just thank you for your time and your uh, attention. All right, thank you so much, Nat and Michelle. Um, following the press conference today, just so everybody knows, we'll be sending out a press release. Um, and if you do want to do any one-on-one -on -one interviews, we're happy to set those up as well. Just please reach out to. Um, myself or Emily Osborne, who is on the call as well. Um, and we'll put our emails in the chat. Um, we do have one question. Um, Christina Ferguson um, is interested to know a little bit more about what specific projects along Lake Michigan in Western Michigan are we uh, participating in? And then what can homeowners do um, on their property to help? Yeah, great. So um, a lot of our so with the spatial prioritization results have really honed in on the river mouths of Western Michigan, the Muskegon River, the Grand River, several other smaller rivers as critical coastal wet, 
coastal areas. Um, right now we are working in um, at the mouth of the Grand River and upstream a little bit in the Grand River to restore emergent vegetation uh, and soften shorelines in that region. We're working with Ottawa County Parks, incredible um, landowner, um, conservation organization in Ottawa County. Um, and um, uh, they have new new properties that they're restoring right now at the mouth of the Grand River, which are really incredible areas to visit if you have the chance. Um, and then I'd say for for homeowners, um, one of the one of the biggest issues we have is um, the lack of native plants, or <laughs> or to put it another way, is in, invasive plants. And uh, you know, restoring big coastal marshes is not always going to be something that landowners can participate in. But you can participate in creating habitat in in your backyard, um, and that can be small. As you saw, Baltimore Orioles have declined by forty percent, right? And Baltimore Orioles can depend on very small patches of of habitat in your backyard. The problem is most of the ornamental um, non-native plants that people use in landscaping um, are not uh, beneficial to insects and don't produce the type of fruit that our birds can eat. So the biggest thing I'd say landowners can do on their land is get native plants uh, planted. And we've got a ton of resources to help you do that. And our chapters would love to help you get involved as well if you go to our website and look at native plants. Great, thank you, Nat. We have another question from Danielle from Wisconsin Public Radio. And she'd like to little, know a little bit more about Green Bay and the St. Louis River Estuary Projects. Yeah, the, the St. Louis River Estuary um, is, is really unique and critical area for marsh birds and migratory birds. A lot of raptors and songbirds depend on that area that are crossing Lake Superior. Um, the, um, there's a large collaboration of folks that are working on St. Louis River Estuary to restore habitat. Uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Minnesota Land Trust is doing a lot of great work. And Audubon is coming in and starting a couple new projects, including one at Alois Bay, which you have to look up. It's unbelievable. It's at Wisconsin Point, just on um, on the shores of Lake Superior. It's the last place we had black terns in that region. Uh, and we're going to restore uh, a, maybe a couple thousand acres of wetlands there. We're in the early, we're in the planning phases right now, but we've secured funding. Um, there's a couple of cha Audubon chapters, Duluth Audubon Society and Schwamigan Bay Audubon Society, amazing chapters of National Audubon that are advocates for these sites, connecting people, engaging them um, with the sites, but also being stewards for the sites in the long term. Um, but within the St. Louis River Estuary as a whole, you have tens of thousands of acres of coastal wetlands that can be maintained um, and enhanced in a way to provide maximum benefit for, for birds. Green Bay, a um, lot of great work there and partners uh, again as well. Ducks Unlimited is very active in Green Bay as is Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Green Bay is an area of concern because of past pollution issues, um, but we're also seeing incredible signs of recovery there. Piping was one of the areas where piping plovers have come back um, and created, created uh, barrier islands that help reduce some of the, the sediment loading coming out of the Fox River and others uh, to create shallower areas that can support marsh. Once you do that, it's a win-win cycle because the marsh then traps more sediment and creates more marsh uh, rather than just having rivers empty into kind of the open bay there where we had a lot of uh, chemical and sediment and nutrient loading in years. So a lot of great restoration there. We've identified, uh, I think, uh, eight or 10 projects in Green Bay that can continue to support that recovery. Um, but I'd be happy, we'd be happy to dive in more um, on individual conversations about each priority region as well. All right, we have Brandon Chu from Great Lakes Echo would like to know a little bit more about expected changes with bird migration patterns. Um, and that's something that we could also follow up with. I know he shared some of his contact information. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point and something I probably should have mentioned as well. Um, so with climate change, not only are we seeing that climatic envelopes, we like to call them, the climatic ranges shift to the north um, and that impacts birds in different ways depending on how they can adapt. But we're also seeing other more immediate or direct impacts um, from climate change like false springs where we have now blooms early in spring and 
birds who have evolved over thousands of years with, with their migration patterns based on when certain plants and insects are available to eat are, are, are being severely impacted by that. Migr migration of birds is the most fragile part of their life cycle. Most 85% of adult mortality occurs during migration. So if, if, uh, if the berries and the seeds and the insects are not there while birds are migrating, they're gonna be in real trouble. Um, it, it, large heat waves in the spring is also known to kill young birds in the nest, drought, flooding, uh, wildfires, you name it, all of those impacts from climate change are, are severely impacting birds. All right, we have a question from uh, Adria Walker, and she'd like to know a little bit more about um, the projects in Rochester, Buffalo. She's from the Democrat and Chronicle in Rochester. Yeah, I mean, that might be a good one to, to have a separate call on, Nicole, um, but incredible work at Cranberry Pond now in partnership with uh, New York Department of Environmental Conservation um, and Audubon New York, our office, National Audubon's office in New York leads that work. Uh, Genesee Valley Audubon is an unbelievable champion for the Great Lakes. That's our chapter in the Rochester area. We'd love to connect you to them. And June Summers, their president, um, we're restoring um, Cranberry Pond, which um, is a coastal wetland that is severely degraded. Um, we've just been looking at pictures of big machines uh, digging out um, some <laughs> what we call potholing and channeling. Uh, in some of these places that are overrun with invasive species, we dig them out and create um, deeper water areas because it's really the mix of open water and emergent vegetation that is critical for marsh birds. Um, so again, we, we, we've had this uh, transformation from, those, from rich mosaics to either open water ponds with no vegetation or overrun areas of Phragmites and cattail are two of the dominant invasive species. So where it's overrun with cattail, one of the first things we do is dig out channels and again, get an almost immediate response from birds. And that's what we've done in Rochester. Great. Uh, James from Great Lakes Echo would like to know a little bit more about altered hydrology. Is it attributed mostly to agriculture, erosion or something else? Well, um, when I think about altered hydrology, I, I'm mostly thinking about the urban areas and urban development that have drained wetlands to build on them or blocked them, stagnated water levels with roads, railroads, communities. Um, again, prior to 1970s, we were just draining and filling wetlands and that cre created a tremendous amount of problems. But in places like um, Milwaukee and Chicago and Detroit and Rochester, Buffalo, much of our wet, natural wetland system that depended, depends on a natural slow ebb and flow of water levels. The water levels go down, sun hits the mud, seeds germinate, plants come up, then water levels slowly go back up and you get that rich mosaic that you need. Where you have fragmented water levels, it stays stagnant and you get no vegetation like ponds or it's drained and you get a ton of vegetation. So mostly thinking of ur urban. And now that's one of the bigger pushes that we're working on is um, to reconnect those areas where feasible. Um, and thanks to the to, to funding that's now provided, it becomes more feasible to do things like uh, connect Powderhorn Lake and Wolf Lake in Southeast Chicago, two coastal wetlands that have been separated for 50 years. Um, so by connecting those or by installing a, a, a pump, we can, artificially simulate the natural ebb and flow of water levels. And that's really innovative work that we're doing to, to restore wetlands now. All right, I think we have another question uh, from Michigan. If you could talk a little bit about the Upper Peninsula work and if there are particular bird species that we're focusing on in Western uh, uh, Lake Michigan area. Uh, the Upper Peninsula is Michelle's favorite. Do you wanna talk about it at all, Michelle? Or do you want me to? Okay. Um, so as you saw from the, the model, Upper Peninsula is the most critical place for marsh birds in the Great Lakes. I think that's safe to say. Um, the um, less, less development, they're protected areas, but we see a tremendous opportunity for more protected areas in the Upper Peninsula. And we're working with landowners like Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the Sioux Tribe of Chippewa Indian, 
uh, to really identify opportunities for large scale protection of those wetlands. That's probably the most critical action we can take there now. Now might be the, a great time to do that with new initiatives like the 30 by 30 push from the Biden administration to get 30% of land in the United States protected. We're currently at about 12%. So we got to over double it if we want to get there in the next nine years now and counting. But if I were to invest, if I had millions of dollars to invest in protection and it would be in the upper peninsula, um, really a tremendous area still for, for many of our species, critical for migration because it's just before they have to cross the lakes, which is a pretty tough journey for the birds, um, but also tremendous uh, coastal wetlands. And then the other one was, was Western Michigan. Yep, Western Lake Michigan. Um, so Western Lake Michigan, Green Bay would be, is, is the most critical. I forget the numbers, Michelle might know them. I think it's 50% of the coastal wetlands or something like that in, um, in Lake Michigan are in the greater Green Bay region, which spills over into the upper peninsula. Um, the more Southern Western Lake Michigan areas are pretty altered because of development in places like Chicago and Gary, Indiana. So different approaches kind of depending on where we are, but definitely in the Calumet region, we're, we're working to fix altered hydrology, um, deal with a tremendous amount of pollution um, and recover um, native emergent plant species in the wetlands that remain. There are still some that can be protected there and restored, but our first step is to really look at those that are already protected and enhance, restore their quality. All right, I think that's the bulk of questions that we have. Again, um, if anyone is interested in doing a follow-up, oh, we actually have a couple more coming in. Um, let's see, from Christina, she'd like to know a little bit of more about the grassland and aerial insectivores that you highlighted. Are there any specific projects pertaining to some of those species? Yeah, absolutely. So our, our Great Lakes Initiative is really focused on coastal areas and coastal wetlands. And that's what you'll find in the bulk of this report. But we do work outside of that, of this initiative as well. And Grassland birds and aerial insectivores are two of the highest priority um, suites of species that we focus on. Uh, so we work in grasslands um, in Michigan and Illinois. We work with agencies to um, implement best practices with um, with conservation with uh, sorry with agriculture, um, which obviously has had a huge impact on on the loss of grassland habitat for for grassland birds. But in similar ways. Um, grassland birds depend on, on quality grasslands that remain. So our strategies really are, are similar in order to get, get that habitat on the ground in key places, especially now more northerly places where we're seeing the future may be even more important for birds like bobolink and Henslow sparrow uh, that are already shifting the ranges to the north because of climate change. Um, aerial insectivores is, is, a very, is a very challenging um, suite of species to work on. Really, you gotta work on um, on their, what they're eating, right? And, um, and now with new, um, new links of um, um, chemical contamination and insect declines, uh, it's a really important area to focus on is uh, uh, creating uh, conditions that allow an ecosystem base still to be there, which is the insects. Um, so a lot of work can be done in urban areas as well for aerial insectivores. Birds like chimney swifts need um, places to roost. So they used to roost um, in caves that, and uh, cliffs that no longer exist. So now they've taken to chimneys, um, but they're phasing out of chimneys, so they're losing habitat there as well. So uh, creating chimney towers for, for birds like that um, is really critical. There's a lot more you can see on, on Audubon's website on how we focus on different suites of species like aerial insectivores and grasslands. All right, we have a couple questions from James at Great Lakes Echo um, on wind turbines. We can send a link in here though that can give him some more information on that. I think Marnie just posted that. Um, any final questions before we wrap up? Again, we'll be sending out a press release uh, following the presser today. And we can also set up individual uh, interviews if you need additional information. Give a few more seconds here. 
Yes, we can also send the recording as well. It might take a few minutes to download, but once we do, we'll make sure that goes out to everybody that attended the session today. All right, well, thank you so much everybody for taking time out and attending today's press conference. We really appreciate it. Um, again, we'll be sending out the recording to everybody that attended the press release and the link to the report is all already in here, but we'll send that along as well. Thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you very soon. Have a great day.